Uh, so I'm going to tell you about how to take advantage of the modern computing landscape uh, with an idea called domain-specific languages. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, with this, these sorts of capabilities, uh, people like yourselves or people who want to take advantage of uh, the computing capabilities that are available today can actually do so. So, so we're in a, in a situation where we've got lots of data, explosion of data sources, right? So most of the people in this room know more about genomics than I do. But I know that uh, genomics needs a lot of processing. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that, that sequencing is getting cheaper. And the limit to you know, the, being able to take advantage of all this cheap sequencing is actually computation. And so that's not just the, the case for genomics, but also for uh, many other sorts of scientific disciplines, such as climate modeling, where you have huge amounts of data and uh, the computation is the limit. Right? So what we want to do is enable scientific discovery by analyzing this data to understand how to uh, make decisions. And the idea is that you'd like to do this in near real time. Right? And so in order to provide this sort of capability, we're going to have to use all the, the uh, advantages uh, that we get from modern computing platforms. So to give you an idea of sort of you know, how you might program these, these platforms, I've got this chart here, which shows a, a set of uh, uh, programming languages that people potentially use to program uh, computers today. So there's uh, Fortran uh, on, the, on the left, Python, MATLAB, R, JavaScript. And it's all relative to C. So the point of this graph is to show that the languages that most people like to program in, like Python or MATLAB or R, are a factor of, uh, a factor of 10 or 100 or even 1,000 times slower than languages people probably don't like to program in that much, like C or Fortran. Right? So this is just if you're programming a single processor. But of course, we all know that today's computing landscape is really parallel. And it's not just parallel in one dimension, it's parallel in multiple different dimensions. It's what we call heterogeneous, right? So you've got multi-core uh, chip designs, which uh, my research lab pioneered in the mid-'90s. You've got graphics processing units, which provide a huge amount of floating point cap computational power. You have nodes consisting of these things, which are connected by a network in clusters. And some people even use this uh, uh, technology called programmable logic, which uh, you know, actually can be quite uh, useful for doing, uh, uh, doing genomic sequencing. So to give you an idea of, sort of what sort of power you have today in a single high power uh, graphics processing chip, this is a plot of supercomputer performance over the last 20 years. And what it shows is that you know, we've got a steady increase in, in, in performance. And now, of course, we have multiple petaflops available. And of course, supercomputers cost between $10 and $100 million. However, if you look at GPU performance today, uh, at, which is a, you know, a few teraflops, you essentially would have the performance of the top supercomputer that you could have bought in uh, the year 2000 for $10 or $50 million. So there's huge amounts of computational uh, power available to you. However, the problem is actually harnessing this power is actually is very difficult, right? You have to deal with low-level programming models which match the particular capabilities of the architecture and do not really uh, 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 lend themselves to uh, programming using these high-level programming uh, languages such as Python or MATLAB or R. So to give you an idea of sort of what the challenge is, uh, I teach a course at Stanford to bright CS undergraduates. And as many of, of you know, uh, computer science is the number one undergraduate major at Stanford today. And uh, I teach a course uh, in which we ask them to do a simple parallelization of an image processing algorithm. And we say, uh, we're going to give you four computational units to run this on. And to get full credit, we want, to give you, we want you to get a factor of four improvement. And as you see, uh, you know, these are kind of in, in, in one year that we taught it, there were uh, four, like 44 students in the class. And the student uh, on, on the left barely got to a factor of four. However, the student who did the best on the right got a factor of 4,000. OK? So that's three orders of magnitude difference between someone who barely knew what they were doing 
And remember, these are bright CS undergraduates and someone who really knew what they were doing, uh, who, who really was able to, to uh, get all the performance uh, potential from the machine. And so the question is, how do we allow people to, to write programs that get uh, the, the app, write applications that allow them to focus on their problem rather than focus on getting performance from uh, the computing, modern computing landscape. So there's this gulf between where people uh, uh, want to write their applications to, to uh, solve big data analytic problems and, and actually extracting the uh, capabilities of the machine. And so the approach that we would like to, uh, for people to use is the idea of high level or high performance domain specific languages. So the idea here, is a domain-specific language. And you probably are all familiar with domain-specific languages because I'm sure you, you use some of them, right? So anybody here use MATLAB? OK, a few hands go up. Anybody here use uh, SQL? OK, a few more hands. All right, so these are all domain-specific languages. So what characterizes a domain-specific language? Well, it's focused on the problem at hand. It uses both data types, data structures, and operations that match what you want to do as the application developer, so it makes it very natural, very easy for, for you to do what you want to do. It's restricted. It doesn't do everything. It's not general purpose. And it allows you to more declaratively say what you want to do rather than delve into the details of how you do it. Right? So examples like MATLAB in the field area of, of, of uh, matrix and linear algebra, SQL in relational algebra. If you uh, do a lot of statistics, you might use R. And if you're a graphics person, you might use OpenGL. And so, Traditionally, these, uh, these domain-specific languages have focused on making the problem of writing the program easier, so-called increasing the program of productivity and increasing programmability. And what we would like to focus on is both providing this sort of high-level uh, programmability and, and, and productivity, but also uh, achieving very high performance at the same time. So the way that we'd like people to develop uh, uh, these uh, data analytic applications is with a set of domain-specific languages. And uh, you know, they're shown in, in these black boxes here. And so you might have a domain-specific language for doing uh, matrix and linear algebra, uh, maybe focused on machine learning. You might have one for querying data that looks something like SQL. And you might have one for, for analyzing graphs uh, that, that show up in, in the problems you want to solve. You, there might be complex relationships between uh, the components of your data, and you might want to analyze those using, it, uh, uh, using graph analytics algorithms. And the idea is that each of these domain-specific languages would have a very uh, optimized compiler that would make it run on, uh, very efficiently on this computing landscape. Uh, so the problem, of course, is you know, how many domain-specific languages do you really need? You know, uh, how do you actually develop these, these uh, sophisticated compilers for extracting uh, the insights from the, from the domain-specific languages and translating them down uh, so that they can be exploited and optimized uh, and run efficiently on a variety of different uh, computer architectures? And so I don't have time to go into how that's done, uh, but uh, we have an environment that we call Delight that makes it easy uh, to develop new domain-specific languages and uh, new high-performance domain-specific languages. Let me say a little bit about what we've been able to achieve uh, with, the, with this DSL. It's called Optimal. And I don't have time to go into detail, but uh, working with another colleague at Stanford, Vijay Pandey, who looks at uh, analyzing the output of, of, of uh, protein folding. So he's famous for doing uh, folding at home. And so one of the things he wants to do is analyze the different trajectories uh, over which uh, proteins fold. And he has an algorithm called uh, MSM uh, Builder, uh, or Marco, which uses Markov state models. So initially, he wrote it in Python, and it was way too slow. Then he got a computer scientist to write it in C++. He parallelized it. He did uh, low-level assembly, and he sped it up by 1,500 times. And then that guy left the group, and nobody else knew what to do with the code. And so you know, they were stuck. So we came along, and we coded the, the same thing in Python in this high-level uh, uh, machine, uh, machine learning uh, language called, uh, called Optimal, and we were able to get the same performance on a uh, CPU as the, uh, the, the, uh, the manual program was able to achieve. And also, uh, we were able to take that same code without modification and run it on a GPU and speed it up by another factor of two. 
So that's what uh, is, is possible with these high-performance domain-specific languages. Let me give you another example of, of how uh, these DSLs are being used. So you have you know, high productivity, low performance, low productivity, and high performance. And what we want, of course, is high productivity and high performance. So another thing that, uh, uh, that, that, that can potentially accelerate science is the development of knowledge bases. Right? So here, the idea is you've got an unstructured set of literature. right? So you've got documents that contain text, tables, and images, and you want to actually collate that information into a database. You actually want to read the scientific literature and come up with a database. And so, for instance, you might want to, to look at the fossil record literature and uh, discover the tree of life. Uh, so this is called paleobiology. You might want to understand how drugs interact with the genome. You know, uh, with, with the genome. And uh, uh, there's a colleague uh, that I've been working closely with called Chris Ray, and he's developed a, an environment for doing this. And uh, we've also actually even applied it to uh, uh, anti-human trafficking, uh, and uh, some of this technology was featured on 60 Minutes. Uh, the name of it is called Deep Dive, and uh, the old, whole idea is to allow you, as a, a developer of the knowledge base, to focus on the features, on the signals, instead of the algorithms. And uh, over time, we've, we figured out how to, to make this more efficient. So initially, it took a PhD CS uh, student uh, a year or two to develop a knowledge base. And uh, with the uh, uh, more recent technology, uh, we can uh, uh, use a uh, bioengineering student who developed a uh, uh, a knowledge base called Pharma Deep Dive, which uh, looks at the interaction between uh, drugs and uh, genomics. And uh, they were able to do this in six months. And by the way, I should say that uh, these knowledge bases have better precision and recall than, 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 than humans, right? So humans trying to do the same sort of thing, especially in the paleobiology environment, were not able to achieve the precision or the accuracy of the computer, right? So. Uh, computers don't get tired, and they, they look at all uh, the literature, and they come up with the knowledge base. And the key to making this work, of course, is very efficient and uh, high-performance inference algorithms. And so the core of the inference algorithms have been developed using Optimal, using these high-level domain-specific languages, and this enables you to run these inference engines on the latest hardware, uh, both uh, on clusters and GPUs, and providing very high performance and enabling uh, 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 people to develop these knowledge bases. So we think this is another example of how these high-level domain-specific languages can be used to enable uh, scientists and data scientists uh, to take advantage of mo the modern computing landscape. So thank you. <laughs>